This chapter looks at a topic that is really at the heart of the study of management, motivation. Understanding actions that effectively get individuals to work has now been studied for over a century. We wanted to give a nod in this chapter to some of the classic work done by famous psychologists such as Skinner and Pavlov in the context of training animals. So in this chapter we have David come in with a new puppy, and we use the introduction of this new family member to discuss reinforcement theory, the idea that you can shape an individual's behavior by altering the consequences of their actions. In reinforcement theory, there are four ways to modify behavior. Positive reinforcement occurs when you reward behaviors that you want to continue. You might give a puppy a treat when he does a trick or obeys, and we can reinforce individual behavior through pay and praise. Negative reinforcement involves the removal of an unpleasant outcome following behaviors that you want to continue. If you can train your dog not to run away, then you can remove that uncomfortable leash. In a similar vein, employees are often more comfortable and can work more efficiently when their managers are not looking over their shoulders as is often necessary in training stages. Extinction occurs when bad behavior is not rewarded. When training a puppy to stop unnecessary barking, ignoring their behavior is often the best plan. This strategy also works for employees that constantly wander around the office looking to engage in gossip. Punishment occurs when negative consequences follow behaviors you want to stop. You might tap a puppy on the nose if they try to literally bite the hand that feeds them. Inappropriate employee behavior is often punished through verbal or written warnings or suspension from work in extreme cases. Like training a puppy, catching individuals doing the right things and rewarding them is the best way to reinforce behaviors. When punishment must be administered, the hot stove rule should be followed. This idea, developed by management professor Douglas McGregor, suggests that punishment should be applied to individuals in the same way the hot touch of a stove punishes those that encounter a hot pot or pan. It should be painful enough to make an impact, it should occur immediately, and it should be administered consistently and without prejudice. In the same way that it's important to administer punishment in a certain manner, how you schedule positive reinforcement has an important impact on performance as well. Reinforcement schedules address the implications of how and how frequently performance is rewarded. Continuous reinforcement is a schedule where a reward is administered every time the desired behavior occurs. For example, when a real estate agent makes a sale, a commission is given. Fixed ratio reinforcement applies reward once for a predetermined number of behaviors. For example, promotional cards that give you a free drink, coffee, or sandwich after 10 purchases would be using this kind of reinforcement. Variable ratio reinforcement is administered randomly following the desired behavior. Slot machines use this kind of reinforcement schedule. The important lesson to learn from reinforcement theory is that we want to reward the right kinds of behavior and discourage bad behavior. But this doesn't always happen in organizations because managers may not want to face the discomfort of dealing with disruptive employees. And training employees is different in many ways than training a puppy. For example, many motivational theories are based on an individual's particular needs. One of the most famous theories in this area is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which argues that needs are rank ordered. This framework begins by an individual's desire to satisfy basic needs, such as physiological needs that are satisfied by food, water, and shelter. Once these needs are satisfied, they are no longer motivators. So then, higher needs can be satisfied. The next group of needs include safety needs, such as freedom from danger and pain. Once those needs are satisfied, social needs, such as bonding with others or forming lasting attachments, can be made. Next comes esteem needs, such as the desire to be respected by one's peers and the need to be appreciated. Finally, at the top of the needs hierarchy comes self-actualization, where the peace of mind that comes from satisfying life's goals is the key motivator. One of the criticisms of Maslow's theory is that it's hard to believe that once a lower level need is satisfied, it stops being a motivator altogether. People still need to eat daily, and social and safety needs are also ongoing. Erg theory relaxes the assumption about rank ordering and focuses on just three categories of needs. Existence needs that relate to survival, relatedness needs that tie to relationships, and growth needs that focus on personal development. This theory doesn't have the same strict ranking as Maslow's work, 
but it does have a frustration regression hypothesis that suggests individuals may regress to another need when one type of need is not being satisfied. Some motivational theories avoid the idea of ranking altogether. Herzberg's two-factor theory breaks motivators down into two categories. Hygiene factors are things that deal with the context of the work environment compared to the job itself. So, for example, while air conditioning in an office doesn't motivate you to work hard, if it's not there, it could really detract from work. Motivators, in contrast, are factors such as achievement, recognition, interesting work, and increasing responsibilities that encourage employees to try harder. McClellan's acquired needs theory suggests that individuals acquire three types of needs. Need for achievement relates to the desire to be successful and accomplish goals. Need for affiliation is concerned with the desire to be liked and accepted by others. Need for power relates to the desire to influence others and control their environments. The dominant need that drives an individual's behavior is assessed using the thematic apperception test, where an ambiguous picture is presented and then the needs noted by the individual are more likely to reflect the needs that motivate their behaviors. Another group of motivational theories examine the mental processes individuals use when deciding how much effort to put forward. Expectancy theory suggests that individuals will consider if they can actually achieve a goal, if there is some benefit to them when this goal is achieved, and if that reward is valuable to them. If they answer yes to all three conditions, they will likely be motivated to work towards a particular goal. Equity theory is another process theory that suggests that people are motivated by a sense of fairness based on comparisons they make with their peers. We see this notion come into play a lot in professional sports, but the amount of money is not really the issue for athletes that are making millions of dollars. What is at stake is the idea that an athlete is making more or less than another player that they gauge they are performing better than when it comes time to negotiate the next contract. Equity theory highlights a concern for distributive justice within organizations. Two other forms of organizational justice are often important for managers to consider. Procedural justice refers to the degree to which fair decision-making practices are used to arrive at a decision. We see this come into play in situations where there is an across-the-board raise in a company. In this case, many individuals that are higher performing can become frustrated that the criteria for raises was not based on merit. Finally, interactional justice refers to the degree to which people are treated with respect, kindness, and dignity in interpersonal interactions. Incentives also play a significant role in motivating individuals. Financial compensation is certainly a common incentive to keep people coming back to work. Financial compensation generally includes salary, the base pay the employee will receive for working with the company, and often it includes some sort of bonus cash rewards that are paid above and beyond salary, generally awarded when employees accomplish certain goals and targets. The idea of using incentives has been around for hundreds of years. For example, Napoleon promised 12,000 francs to anyone who could devise a new method of preserving food for the army. The winner created a new way to can food. Research shows that companies that use pay-for-performance reward systems outperform their rivals. There are several different types of incentives to choose from. Piece rate incentives pay employees on the basis of the individual outputs they produce. Merit pay provides a permanent pay raise based on past performance. Sales commissions reward employees with a percentage of sales volume, or profits generated. Awards and plaques can be effective for companies on a budget. Team bonuses can be effective if individual effort is reflected in team performance. Gain sharing is a company-wide program where employees are rewarded for performance gains compared to past performance. Profit sharing involves sharing a percentage of company profits with all employees. Stock options gives an option for employees to purchase company stock at a predetermined price. An important management role is setting goals in an effective manner. The most effective goals follow the SMART criteria of being specific, measurable, aggressive, realistic, and time-bound. Providing this level of detail to an employee will almost surely be more effective than telling someone to do their best. Providing regular feedback about presentable performance against the goal can also increase motivation.
Management by objectives is a tool that aligns the goals of the individual with the organization's goals by incorporating both the individual and the corporate goals in the goal setting process. The job characteristics model asserts that there may be aspects of the job itself that might motivate employees. The five characteristics in this model are skill variety, task identity, task significance, autonomy, and feedback. Jobs that are high in these characteristics tend to be associated with more desirable outcomes such as higher motivation, performance, satisfaction, and lower absenteeism and turnover. In general, many of the jobs Atlas has held in the past are not particularly high in regard to the positive job characteristics associated in this model. And creating this kind of job is difficult for those of us who don't end up as brain surgeons and astronauts. Overall though, I do hope this chapter has provided some insights on how to effectively motivate others and how to understand your own motivations as you engage in your work.